Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Full Tank Motorcycle Podcast with myself, Rob, from the YouTube channel Motobob, and I'm joined by my good bud, Tim, a channel regular, and it has to be said, at least 50% of why this podcast is listenable, probably... <laughs> Maybe a little bit more. I might need to up my game. That's very kind. I'd put myself slightly lower, but that's nice. You've never called me Bud before. I like that. Oh, it's because it rhymes with good. Uh, <laughs> anyway, we're back with a fresh batch, let's say, of uh, the best news stories from the motorcycle industry. And I think we'll just jump right in, Tim, with one yep. that's quite exciting. In fact, this is embargoed, so you haven't seen it yet. Ooh. But we had an inkling that something big was coming from Indian uh, when we were mm. at the London Motorcycle Show, didn't we? Because there were a few murmurings that something might be on the way. Yeah. And it had to be the Scout, basically, because, um, you know, it's their kind of bigger volume, lower price bike that's maybe been due a bit of a refresh. I don't know if that's fair mm. to say. It's not a bike that sort of um, is necessary ble necessarily bleeding edge in terms of... Um, you know, that genre doesn't really need to be bang up to date. But, mm. you know, it's been a little while. So here we go. It's apparently a ground up redesign. I won't go into the full details. You'll be able to see those on the main channel where I go into all the kind of different changes. But I would say, Tim, having a look at the sort of um, styling, let's find a nice selection mm. of pictures here. Well, the whole range anyway. What's your vibe? What are you thinking? I, there's one that grabbed my attention first off, which was... The OG was the original. Uh, they had them side by side, i got to say. Uh, mm. It's good, it's good, but very few things kind of actually uh, are as good as the original, for sure. I mean, in anything, really. But yeah, I would say I like the silhouette of that. It's uh, It looks like it's had a bit of a re-sculpting of the tank. Wow, well done, mate. Because actually, I was going to say, considering it's pretty ground up, yeah. Uh, they have still kept the overall shape pretty similar. Mm. And one of the key things that they did talk about was that redesign on the fuel tank, which yeah. is a little bit of a different shape, almost more rounded, would you say? Yeah, I'd go with that. I, I think it is, I mean, it's, it's marginal, but I'd say it is a small improvement, yeah. You've got a few different versions as well now. So some of them, of course, directly replacing previous iterations of the Scout. So we've still got a bobber. Mm. The Sport Scout, I guess it's a bit like the Scout Rogue. Uh, there was something similar to that previously. Super Scout looks quite cool. Uh, and mm -hmm. then Scout Classic, which I think would have been called the just the Scout before. But maybe mm. that, that's tried to make them a little bit more digestible for your average person who maybe isn't already familiar mm. uh, with the lineup but here's the tasty one look indian 101 scout mm. you see is that, that like the yeah is that their special edition kind of like very Option 719 bmw style exactly mate upside down forks mm. big break upgrade twin discs it's the one that's built to go a bit a bit of a fairing bar and mirrors so it's got the looks as well yeah which one tickles your pickle? If that's I'm going to say the actually, Super Scout. <laughs> <laughs> My pickle is being tickled by the Super Scout, I think, on this occasion. Oh, yeah, like you say, the most traditional looking. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, maybe maybe adjust the screen as in, like, you know, put something else on some aftermarket. But, uh, yeah, I like the panniers as well to it. I think with this, this kind of bike, the sort of the panniers are, they help balance the shape Leather a, bit, a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, also also highly functional. You can actually take stuff with you. Yeah, I think that's probably fair. Now, look, uh, like I say, there's more detail on the main channel. But what I wanted to talk to you about, Tim, is where I think they've played a bit of a blinder with this bike. And that's with the varying trim levels. Because what I really, 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 really loved about the Indian Scout when I first rode it was like the fact that it's quite raw. You mm -hmm. know, 100 horsepower from that V-Twin. Uh, the, the engine's been reworked, but the previous gen, 100 horsepower, very direct throttle delivery. And then the only rider raids or whatever that it had, I think it was just ABS, actually. There's no yeah. traction control. Yeah, there was no traction control. I know that for sure, because we both sort of made mention of that, because it's got quite a lot of power to put down, and it just lets you just, yeah, unleash yes. it, go for it. And on the bobber, you know, it's got those slightly, like, semi-nobbly-looking tyres. 
Um, so they're probably not mm. 100% grippy. We've, we've taken that bike out in suboptimal weather conditions as well. So that's probably that's cr- cold true. road going into it. But also things like, um, yeah, no riding modes, no engine drag torque control, no slipper clutch, no nothing. I remember actually taking one from Crazy Horse in London and it had like a set of straight through pipes on it. Within 500 meters of getting out the forecourt, I realized it was quite powerful for a cruiser with a lively throttle and giving yeah. it the gas and being like, wow, this is fun for a cruiser. Quite light as well. Really great sound because of the open pipes. And then the, tr- the, the next set of traffic lights went red and I'm off the gas, slowing down, banging down the gears. And, you know, it's squirreling around at the back end because mm. it's not got a slipper clutch. I'm so used yeah. to having slipper clutches, especially on bikes like that. And it made me think straight away, this is a bike you have to... Uh, apply a bit of skill to ride and it's really mm-hmm. engaging. I love that about it. Yeah, and I think, I mean, that's what a lot of people cry out for, right? They want something to feel authentically original um, and a lot of people do do not enjoy all of the extra rider aids and stuff like that and that's quite a, that's a comment that comes up quite often, isn't it? Totally. Whether or not people actually, when they live with it, it maybe it's something that they... It's aspirational, but actually, in reality, less practical. Do you know what I mean? Like, people say it, but actually, if they were using it, they might feel differently. Mm. Um, but, yeah, it's good that at least you've you've got that option. That there is something there available if you really do want that kind of raw, just-a-bike experience. I love that. I love that about it. And, mm. you know, you, which one was the one that you rode on that day where we were riding the uh, Scout and MV Gusta Super Veloce? That was Crazy Horse dealership yeah. in, in another location but was that just the scout bobber it was just the bobber yeah windy day wasn't it so it windy. was you, everything in one day yeah you almost <laughs> it was, got blown it was off, windy didn't you? wet uh yeah i did almost get blown off yeah it was uh almost a and very I exciting fil- day <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was filming as well so you would have got it on camera yeah. um yeah fantastic and just um a hoot to ride all the time isn't it and i would say yeah. you know of course Something like, uh, it's a weird combo of bikes to be taken out, but basically that's a motorcycle dealership that carries quite high-end or slightly more niche brands. And mm. so we were just making use of the time by taking two bikes and filming two separate reviews. But it was interesting swapping between those two bikes, a super veloce, like a sports yeah, bike, yeah. loads of power. <laughs> You'd expect it to be the more engaging to ride on the road. Mm. But um, it was almost like it's really very revvy that, 800 triple in the MV Augusta. So you can't use that much of it. You're right over the front. It's very sporty. And especially in those weather conditions, uh, I just kind of felt like you're only operating at a fraction of what it's capable of. Whereas the Scout, Mm -hmm. just turn a corner, point it straight, loads of gas, great sound, loads of shove. So good times. And I think it possibly was the one that was more fun to ride on that given day. Yeah, it's but, certainly more usable, yeah, I would say. The only thing I would say is that it was noticeably very shallow in the lean angle. Um, and even on that kind of crappy day, was we were able to kind of scrape pegs, which was uh, eye-opening. Yes, yeah. I mean, that's part of the course, isn't it, for the cruisers? Yeah, I guess. Uh, but almost adds to, adds to the drama, in a way. But, you know, given that they've got this new version out now, and looking at the spec of the old bike and thinking, well, how did they make it 2024? And looking at the other bikes on the market as well that are similar, one could possibly suggest the Harley Nightster or Sportster S as their kind of like middleweight, modernish cruiser, maybe even like a Triumph Bobber, something like that. Hmm. You know, looking at why people would buy one of those bikes and not a, a Scout. Uh, they had to look at the tech realistically and be like, well, is that a reason that some people are buying the Nightster, which comes with a TFT display? I think in one of the versions, the Sports Dress mm. certainly does. Mm. And even the, the Triumph Bobber has riding modes and stuff, even though it's got quite a simple dash. And so that's what they've kind of offered now, as you can see with these trim levels. But what I think is so brilliant here is you've got standard trim as the base price, cheapest version. Mm-hmm. And that gets ABS, like the old one, LED lights, but then an analog clock, very similar to the old one. 
Mm. Uh, and that's it. It's still the essence of what made the Scout really yeah. cool and fun to ride and feel engaging and feel like you were, like I say, applying your skill. You can still get that and you don't have to pay anything for it, you know? Limited trim. Mm. And again, I might ask you which of these trims tickles the old pickle. <laughs> Less of the Get. old pickle. <laughs> the, <laughs> sorry, mate. The next level of usable technology, they call this. So it gets traction control, cruise control. That's a big one. Mm. USB charger, three riding modes of sport, standard and tour. So you can pay a little mm. bit more and get mm. a whole suite there of actual kind of modes, TC, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm. And then top level, limited plus tech trim is the same stuff, but you also get their round TFT display. So it's very similar in terms of the form factor to the analog mm. clock, which is like one round speedo. But it is a TFT and it has their ride command features built in, which are like navigation that's got downloaded maps that are not reliant on having a connection to your phone and stuff. So it's quite nice. You don't even need to plug your phone in. You can just set a location and go. Okay. It's got all yeah. the bike health stuff. So like it shows you the state of the battery and temperature and I guess maybe TPMS is an option, stuff like that. Mm. Little infographics in that screen so that you can see what's going on with the bike. But of course, that's going to be top of the pile and cost the most money. Yeah. I mean, firstly, let's just say this is a great way of offering something that's going to suit all tastes. Some people do want all the tech and ride a race. Yeah. Some people want yeah. that raw bike. And personally, like looking at this, I'm like, this is a bit of an, in not an innovation, but there aren't that many bikes where you can go from just ABS right up to mm -hmm. built in sat nav yeah. And it also kind of feels like it means you're only paying for the stuff that you want to use. Yeah, no, it, it's definitely a great way of structuring that and tiering it. I think for me, one of the more frustrating ones um, to sort of focus on a negative briefly is, say, KTM, where it feels like they're literally just unlocking something that's in the already bike already, there. right? Yeah, it feels like they're just, it's the package is there and they're just sort of like, oh, we'll turn it on for you. It's not exactly that, but it feels that way. Whereas with this one, you're definitely getting new componentry, which is, uh, you know, you feel like you've, you know, you you can justify that price a little bit more, I would say totally. in my head. And i say for me, I think I, actually I heard recently that people often go for the middle package more than anything else. And I'd say that's that's true of, you know, the majority of people out there. And actually the middle one is the, one that's speaking to me the most. Uh, I do like an analog clock, and I actually think as good as that digital one does actually look, I'd probably prefer the analog, but having the extra little bits of electronic aids, cruise control being a big one for me, uh, which shows I'm a little bit delicate of a rider, I guess. <laughs> I need my, uh, my creature uh, comforts. That's true. But yeah, I'd, I'd say that is, a, that is a big one for me, because this is the sort of bike that probably I would be doing a bit of mileage on, to be honest, especially if I got the sort of panniers in that bigger kind of kit. Well, you did say that the Scout Super or whatever it was called yeah. is the one that picked, uh, that caught your eye with the panniers. Yeah. So that makes sense to get some of those features. So you're saying you're a limited plus tech trim kind of Tim? Uh, no, I'm, an un I'm a limited. Trim. Limited Tim. Yeah, limited Not standard Tim. Tim. <laughs> yeah, basically. So you go, don't need the TFT, but I'd like cruise control. I don't control. need the TFT, yeah, but I like cruise control. Yeah. I think that's such a good point. It depends on which um, version of it you're buying. Because for me, what I've always loved is that bobber style, mm. mean-looking, mean uh, quite powerful, raw, mid-cruiser kind of thing. And so that's what I'd probably go for, the bobber. And in that case, I'm less bothered about cruise control. I'm, I'm not going to go and do a trip on it. I'm just going to... No tear around the block like annoying the yeah. neighbors um <laughs> so i'd probably go standard tim <laughs> and that'd be enough i think but it looks fantastic yeah. and, and you know i think it's interesting to talk about yeah there are some other manufacturers that offer different levels of tech and you can pay more or less um ktm particularly like it seems to annoy some people but what mm. i really just appreciate here is the spectrum of zero to nothing i mean imagine if you yeah. could buy like a 890 duke just with abs yeah. <laughs> oh my and god an analog clock yeah maybe there's a reason they don't do that yeah but true that's the other thing as well we were talking about you know what sort of rider are you are you someone who wants loads of gadgets are you someone that wants a simple bike 
the only other thing I was thinking about it is a lot of these rider raids, you know, the more advanced ABS features or traction control, you know, where it's lean sensitive and all those kinds of things and brake assist or link braking. Mm. You're probably only thankful that you have them if you've just narrowly avoided a crash or a spill. Yeah. Yes. Because they're, they're all safety features, a lot of them. Cruise control is yeah. something you'll use all the time. Electronic mm. suspension something you'll use all the time. Riding mm. modes, I mean, I don't use them a lot when I ride bikes, but I can see how no. someone might use them a lot if they're riding in varying conditions and that's how they like to work. But most of the other ones, um, lean sensitive traction control, lean sensitive yeah, ABS, yeah, yeah. wheelie control could even be part of that if mm-hmm. you're someone who may end up looping their bike. Uh, what else could, could we put in there as well? Yeah, like the, the brake assist features. And even when you're getting into yeah. the advanced like radar stuff, uh, yes. Yeah. You maybe all the safety stuff. Just... Basically, it's it's an insurance, like you say. It only has its value if you have a, ever have an emergency situation, which hopefully you don't have. And I guess majority of people probably don't on a regular basis. So you probably just sort of go, ah, I don't need it. It's fine. You, you you probably like need to see your entire life flash before your eyes before <laughs> you're glad that you opted yeah, for yeah. the limited. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had a couple of moments like that when I was riding in the wet and commuting uh, on my street twin where the TC just caught something. You know, if you go, over, you go around a corner, you're in a low gear, there's lots of torque and you catch like a wet manhole cover everywhere yeah. when we're both commuting in London. You know, probably nowadays I'd say, oh, I don't really need traction control or things like that because I've become more experienced as a rider. But when it does happen, gosh, Squeaky bum time, as Alex Ferguson <laughs> would say. Yeah, you just pucker up a little bit, yeah. Yes. It's uh, the, your gratitude, your sort of sense of value for money is directly proportionate to the frequency of puckers. <laughs> <laughs> and if our podcast editor could put that on a graph and put that on the screen now, yeah. I believe that'd be a very excellent visual to illustrate the point. Anyway, well done to Indian. I think it looks really cool. And I'll look forward to trying some of those out in all those different flavors. It's going to take us a while to kind of uh, work our way through them all, isn't it? Yeah. But <laughs> yeah, it will do, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but I, I, up... it's a sacrifice we'll have to make, I'm afraid. <laughs> yes, well done, mate. Take one for the team yeah. and uh, put yourself on the line, isn't it? So that mm. other people can hear about whether your selection of trim level is. Um, <laughs> optimal you get to ride around for maybe two weeks on a brand new indian Mm. Uh, but it's important journalism so well done mate next up we've got another brand spanker kind of i mean i've just put it on the screen again i'm Mm. i'm giving you a bit of a tricky task this week i'd say because i'm I didn't give you much chance to prep. I'm just showing you stuff and saying, yeah. what do you think of this? And this is also yeah. embargoed, which is why we haven't talked about it before. Mm. But I mean, do you even, can you even get a sense of what this is? Uh, <laughs> other than it being an MV and other than it being a slightly bigger version of their adventure bike. Uh, yeah, I think that's all I've got to go on. You're not getting the most polished version of it. Normally I prep lots, and you'll know this, Rob. I mean, other people won't know behind the scenes how much preparation I do for this. <laughs> Look, you're not too far off there, mate. It's a, an MV Augusta Enduro Veloce. Mm. And basically it is, I don't know if it's bigger. It's a good question. I don't think it is. It maybe is just mm. the um, flatter color scheme that makes it look a bit okay. more slab like but this is the non special edition version this is your man of the people kind of version of their mm. lxp Oriole Ori, Orioli. i can't say yeah. that <laughs> Orioli that they announced at eichmer which was mm. based upon the 9.5 lucky explorer that they announced a couple of years before that so yeah. effectively i hadn't realized that bike which they say is going to cost around thirty thousand euros which is you know about twenty six thousand pounds i believe yeah. um is like a special edition it's the creme de la creme of what you could get uh on this platform it's got the okay. fancier paint job and stuff this is your 
more affordable every man's bike. Yeah, it's hard to say without like a side by side comparison between the two of them, but it's not quite as arresting looking. Um, yeah, but a paint job is. can it, do it, wonders, can't it? It really, yeah, it really can. Apparently, yeah. It also maybe looks a little, yeah. Actually, now that you've got that one up, I can see that they are. I guess that they are the same, but. There is a few, I mean, there's different tyres. Uh, tyres are weird ones, really, actually, because they do change the look of a bike quite a lot when you stick on the knobblies as opposed yeah. to the road tyres. But Yes. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's a few other sort of tweaks on there I'm sure that you'll take us through, but that's that's kind of my first initial impression, yeah. What, which one do you prefer looks-wise in terms of, like, the paint job? Because obviously this is more like Agostini-inspired yeah, with the true. silver and red, a very typical of Envy Augusta. Um, mm. Whereas the other one is Kajiva Elephant inspired that whole Lucky Explorer vibe. Yeah, I mean, it's that one. It's the LXP that's uh, that's standing out to me. That that is the one I would get. I think it's just it allows the black to stand out a bit more as well because you've got white and black and little tiny bits of red, little flashes of red on it. I think it looks better to my eye, but there's not a lot in it, I guess. Again, there's going to be a more comprehensive video on the main channel, of course, with all big motorcycle announcements. So do check mm. out Moto Bob if you haven't already. But you can see it's like, yeah, the paint, but also little details like the... The bash plate uh, as well, right? E e yes, I think it's a bit more hardy on the yeah. premium version. Uh, the rims are those, are they called Excel? Mm. Top level, off-road, nicely made, polished rims. In terms of the actual spec, like I say, I won't go into that too much here. But I think what I wanted to talk about with this is whether this way of launching a bike has made the specialness diminish over time. So, like, let's have a look at the timeline for this because I was thinking mm. about it. So I did a bit of research, mate. Quite impressive if, you, if I don't say it myself. <laughs> Launched in 2021, the 9.5 Explorer, Lucky Explorer, yeah. sorry, which is the prototype version and they said we're making yeah. a new 950 triple that's going to be a lot more mid-range and torque biased um and it's going to look like this and we're also going to make a couple of other versions that are like smaller capacity i think they talked about a 5.5 or something like that hmm. but initially that's when we were like wow <clears throat> envy augusta making an adventure bike adventure bike yeah. selling really well envy augusta makes some of the best looking bikes on the market and some of the most bonkers and fun to ride this yeah. is a match made in heaven how exciting. I can't wait to see it. And they then went a bit quiet for a while. I remember in 2022, Bennett's Bike Social uh, sent a journalist, I think it was Chad, who's a um, super experienced yeah. journalist, does a lot mm -hmm. of this sort of thing, uh, went out to the factory to ride the prototype version, which was all blacked out. But mm -hmm. I was starting to think, well, if he's been allowed to ride it and write about it, it's not just a gig where he's giving feedback or whatever, which I think he does as well, Yeah. then it must be getting pretty close. But then it's only another year later, the LXP Orioles announced. So we mm. share that. And then now, a few months later, you've got this standard model. Mm. And it just has me wondering. I mean, I'm no expert in launching motorcycles, and I'm sure no. there's reasons for it. And there's lots of things that go into it. But just on my side of it, like my observation is that maybe the anticipation and excitement mm -hmm. has had too much time to sort of wash away. And I've noticed every time I talk about the MV Adventure Bikes, the uh, numbers just get lower and lower because yeah. people, like even the LXP Orioli at, mm -hmm. at um, Eichmann this year, one of the most um, specky, like interesting exciting looking bikes a big brand yeah. uh, that do these really premium aspirational bikes you know yeah. that video just didn't do that well compared to honda's nx 500 or you know <laughs> which is an exciting bikes. bike yeah and, and, and that's kind of surprising it just makes me think yeah, yeah, yeah. like what, what if they just announced this first and then later yeah. said oh here's the special edition as well if you want to go up a notch so i wonder whether it's like it's either a marketing mismatch or whether it's a bike that people just aren't as excited about, maybe in terms of like the way it's going to perform. If someone is really thinking of taking it off-road, maybe they're thinking, ah, it's not as good as such and such. And I think a good example, and one that's not too dissimilar, would be the Ducati Desert X. If you look at the buzz and the hype that surrounded that bike, which is 
some, it's got some similarities to this, although obviously it's uh, the engine configuration is very different and other things. But yeah, I think I can draw some parallels, at least just in the looks and the influence that it's come from as well, right? Um, yes. Then I would say that one got quite a hype. And if you see one of them in the wild, people get quite excited and, you know, people are queuing up to sort of sit on it at motorcycle shows as well. Whereas with this one, it was kind of in the corner just by itself. And obviously you couldn't sit on it because it was on a stand and things, but... Was that at the yeah. London show? Yeah. yeah. Um, so there was definitely, I would say there is, sadly, a little bit less excitement to this one. I couldn't put my finger on it. But yeah, even talking to people, it's not one that sort of grabs attention just anecdotally amongst the Maybe that, that I know. Maybe that, that strategy of launching the more expensive exciting one first at like 30,000 euros just makes everyone mm. think, that's out of my budget. Whereas the, Maybe. the Ducati Desert X is... Still quite expensive compared to like a KTM 890 Adventure or something like that, but it's still mm. pretty much half the price of what you're looking at here. For me, yeah, exactly. That's it. It's, it either has to be really exclusive in terms of, you know, it's a special bike and, and people are excited by it, or it has to be an outperformer. It has to be better than the competition, in which case it sort of justifies the extra price. If it's none of those things, then it has to be competitively priced with its market. Otherwise, there is no reason to buy it, and it's not going to draw people in. What would you go for? 20 grand in your pocket. What yeah. did I say? 20 grand, then? 20 grand in your pocket. <laughs> and you can choose from. Hmm, let me give you some options. This, <clears throat> obviously, because that's the point. Sure. A Desert X and the five grand, or a fairly decked out, R1300 GS, which I think the one that I tested had almost everything on it, and it was like 22,000, so let's say that. Yeah, I'm going to slap my 20 grand down <laughs> and take 5 grand back and go for the Desert X. Would you? Down. Yeah. No, it's, here's the big thing with that one, and the reason I think their marketing, well, grab me at least, is because they put that in the hands of proper experienced riders who all came back grinning, being like, this thing can absolutely handle. This is a weapon. So from that perspective, you kind of want to know that the, you've got the bike to be on, right? That this is the Don. Yeah. Um, even if you're never going to be good enough to show it off, you you want to know that you've got the right bike. And I think that is the case with the Desert X. Sometimes with the MVs, they get announced and then because they're so exclusive and expensive, you don't get a chance to ride them or it's rare to get the chance. Like it's yeah. harder to get the chance than you know, a, a mainstream manufacturer that have a decent fleet of press bikes and you've got a contact where you go and pick them up. You know, there's like an established mm. process. That doesn't mm. really, it's a bit more ad hoc with the MVs. But mm. now that they're part of the Piera Mobility Group who owns KTM and Husvana, they're kind of taking some of that responsibility. So it's actually mm. seems like it's going to become more accessible for journalists. And then they have mentioned they will have a press bike of this um, and it will be you know, available. So um, maybe that is the big differentiating factor. What you need is a few people to go and ride this and come back and say whether it's um, yep. truly good or not. But mm. I mean, I'm hoping it is because effectively what you've got here, I think I mentioned this before, is my Tiger 800 on steroids, mm. an mm. inline triple, no T-plane or anything silly like that. Gorgeous styling, top notch components. The tech is like right up there as well. It's mm. like someone's taken my Tiger 800 and just, you know, improved everything, let's say. But, <laughs> but I'm expecting still some of the same mid-rangey triple character. Mm. So certainly, in the, in the same way that you selflessly volunteered yourself to test out inter the entire Indian Scout range in yeah. the name of um, consumer Science. research. Science, yeah. Look, I'll take this one, mate. Okay. You're welcome. That's fair. Yes. <laughs> Interested to hear what the audience thinks of it, though, so do let us know down in the comments below, especially if you're on the YouTube version of this video and watching it visually, which I'll probably say, given how much we've been talking about how the bikes look, would be a good idea. Moving swiftly on, Tim, mm. the next story I was going to look at is a piece on MCN uh, where they talked about the fact that electric motorcycle sales have plummeted uh, by almost a third year on year, whereas petrol bikes are on the up. So they're saying that the figures from MCIA, which is the Motorcycle Industry Association here in the UK, who publish all the sort of sales figures, 
uh, say that there have been 10,000 new bikes registered since the beginning of 2024, which is nearly 6% up on the same figures last year. With February alone, almost 5,000 bikes were sold, and that's 6.5% up on last February. So really strong numbers, which is great mm. to see for everybody here who has a job that relies on the motorcycle industry keeping going. Um, but also, like when you pick into those numbers, you know, some of the bikes that are selling really well are the MT-07, the new GS, uh, the Suzuki GSX ATAR, which we'll come back to. But they say that the electric category is down by 31.4% when compared with February last year. They don't really give any mm. uh, background to why, but that is some slump. I don't know if uh, maybe the tax breaks or like grants or whatever have changed, have they? Is there anything like that around electric bikes? I haven't seen anything like I that. I mean, I think it's probably a host of different reasons. One of which, very boring, could be just the energy prices have uh, changed as well. Those, I mean, that's a slow shift, but it's been over a, a fair while. But yeah. I'd say that's some good lateral thinking there mm -hmm. and reasoning. It hadn't even occurred to me. So yeah, that's a fair point. I mean, if it's costing double to charge it up, it starts yeah. to look quite a lot less appealing. Yeah. Although, Tim, you could argue that fuel prices aren't exactly a bargain either. So. No, they're not. But I know that the, I mean, I, cause I don't know if you're across the sort of cars as well, but I think the same is or similar is true in the cars is that um, they've kind of, they were, people were sort of uh, nervous to kind of adopt it early. Um, and then it kind of had a, a, a surge or an incline. And then uh, it's kind of plateaued a little bit just because of the charging stations. It's becoming, uh, because there are more of them on the roads, the charging stations are charging more. And there's also quite a lot of difference between the rates and costs, I think, of where you charge it, how you charge it, you know, what sort of system you're on. So it's just, it's a bit all over the place, to be honest. Um, so, yeah, I would say... It's a tricky one to justify because originally it was, you know, all right, it costs more to buy it outright because they're more expensive to produce, but the running costs are lower, so it'll balance out eventually. But, you know, I saw studies, I'm sure you did as well, that were saying that it, the, it would take however many years for it to actually balance out, so it, it still didn't really make sense. And although, yeah, petrol's still going up as well, it's uh, it's not a sort of... It's not a, a question of saving your money, so you really have to like the machine... And I'd say a lot of people out there still like that tingle in their dingle. Nah. Um, they still they still like the, the throb of an engine. So, yeah. Moving swiftly on from the talk of throbbing, uh, <laughs> I thought it was kind of interesting just looking at those petrol numbers. Obviously, the new GS was going to be a big seller mm -hmm. uh, because the previous gen was like pretty much yeah. the best-selling bike around. Uh, the MT-7 is a surprise as the top dog, but the mm. one that really shocked me is the new Suzuki GSX-8R, yeah. making yeah. a splash with 57 sales across the month of Feb. Um, the reason I'm so shocked, mate, is because when I was down at a local dealer who carries the, um, the Suzuki lineup, mm -hmm. uh, someone mentioned that the <clears throat> GSX-8S from last year the naked version of this bike, uh, I didn't think it was like flying off the shelves for some reason. Hmm. And I've ridden it. It's brilliant. Really nice yeah. engine. Torquey, rich, smooth, uh, actually surprisingly quick, handles nicely, hmm. has quite a simple tech package that is yeah. actually easy to use. But for some reason, it just wasn't selling that well. And then fast forward a year, it is almost exactly the same bike with a fairing and slightly lower bars. Like, the te like some of the styling, the tail section and stuff, almost exactly the same uh and yet it's like mm -hmm. apparently just from those figures alone i'm sure if you dig into it more maybe it's about stock levels or just the timing of it or how many are registered rather than actually sold or you know all things like that it's just yeah surprising because of what i heard about the the other bike yeah and also i think from from me what i've heard about suzuki in sort of not even recent years for a long while actually They've been, well, not as um, sought after as, you know, even Honda, Kawasaki, they're sort of their neighbours. Um, so, yeah, it's that's good to see, though, to be fair, because, uh, you, I mean, you've got a Suzuki. I started on a Suzuki. I've got a sort of soft spot in my heart for a Suzuki. So I'd like to see them doing slightly better. I want to see them go from strength totally, to strength. Totally, mate. So, yeah, and and this good. is, I guess, the whole intention of this new engine. Like you said, they haven't been doing anything new for years and years and years. Yeah. Maybe people are 
zoned out a bit of like yeah. Suzuki brand awareness because there's nothing exciting to talk about. Mm. And then they brought in this new parallel twin and it's given them a middleweight adventure bike, a road bias version of that, a naked bike, now a sports bike. Not sure how the V-Strom 800 variants are doing, mm. uh, but yeah, cool to see this taking off. And I will say one key difference that you have to observe here is that one of the reasons I expect that the GSX AS, if, if what I heard is true, didn't sell that well, one of the key reasons has to be the fact that it was going directly up against, like literally the same ICMA they were both announced, mm. then, then a few months later they both announced in dealers, um, was the Honda Hornet, the CB750, which mm -hmm. had 10 more horsepower and mm. cost about £1,000 less. Yeah. And it's really hard to argue <laughs> with that. <laughs> and in many yeah. ways, like for me, the Suzuki is kind of a better bike because it, it's taller okay. in the seat, so it feels like an actual big bike. The mm. Horner is a bit dinky at the back. It sits a bit lower. You're a bit more upright. Uh, mm -hmm. feels more like something that's built for newer riders as well in mind, okay. whereas the, the Suzuki less so. And the styling's probably a bit more aggressive and interesting on the Suzuki. Mm. But ultimately, it's hard to get past those very tempting headline figures that are always going to swing. Yeah. You know, I mean, if you're getting more power for bike. less money and it looks very similar and it's it's in the same category, I mean, who wouldn't? Who honestly wouldn't go for that? And they don't look miles apart either. They're, you know, it's not too dissimilar for styling and stuff. So yeah, it also had a slightly weird front end to it. That or it has the GSX AS. It's kind mm. of got these little high side fairings, then goes to a, a bit of a point. Mm -hmm. Maybe that aesthetic suits the sports bike a little bit more. I think it is probably a bit better looking yeah. out of the two. Mm. Uh, but it, it's got to be said, if Honda had a 750 sports bike, which surely is in the works, like a CBR 750, with that 90 mm. horsepower parallel twin, if they had that on the market and it looked a bit fire and it had the right paint job and it undercut yep. the Suzuki by a grand mm -hmm. again, you'd have yeah. to think that this probably wouldn't be selling quite so well, but... Yeah. As they say, make hay while the sun shines, and Suzuki just flog them, get them out the door <laughs> before this is quick. Yeah, just before. The, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm. Uh, you do have the the new 660 Daytona, but I mean, one of the problems with that is, I think the uh, yeah they have been reviewed. They did the press launch, and then they're yeah. just coming into dealers now. And so maybe anyone who wanted to get their bike sorted early in the season, you know, that wasn't really an option. Um, no. So maybe Suzuki just timed it right there. Mm. Uh, you do have the R7, RS660 mm -hmm. from Aprilia, all good options. Mm. But uh, yeah, anyway, we'll get hold of one of these eight R's to find out what all the fuss is about as soon as POS. So do keep an eye on the main channel for that. I'll I'm, I'm definitely get hold of one soon. On to comment of the week, mate. I had a look back at our previous video. Well, it's two videos ago now. And one of the things that seemed to... Uh, get people's attention was the new Husqvarna Svartpilen 801. And so here are a couple of comments just to give a little flavor and I'll maybe mm. get your opinion. Johan Jonsson says, would have been interesting to hear your thoughts on all the negative comments on Instagram regarding the new Svartpilen 801. I don't get it. I ba it's basically a mashup between the 401 and 701. And both of those models have had much love from the community. I don't like all the details, mainly the tank graphics and the side panels but i think the overall package looks like a great bike so i've ordered one and then he's put the uh, confetti emoji to celebrate wow uh, a few comments down the feed though np adv could be adventure 2023 says don't agree the husky 800 is not a sexy bike he's not disagreeing with johan jonsson i think he's disagreeing with me saying it's almost the perfect bike yeah the 401 is a sexy bike just as ugly as the 701 i'm really gutted i was hoping it would look more like the 401 and i mean the old 401 as the new one is just as bad and so what i wanted to say to you tim let's get it up on yeah. the screen with a, a, a week or two after it's been launched just to you know reflect let it bed in mm -hmm. did we get it wrong and is this actually a horrible a bike to look at a month yeah <laughs> <laughs> good no, it's not. or bad that is a good looking bike that is one of the best looking bikes of this year that i've seen what do you think the issue is with uh see you know, i this don't know mate negative I mean, commentary on instagram i haven't seen anything really i suppose the tail section is quite short it comes down where the rear yeah. axle is but that's 
part of the, uh, and maybe some of the shapes aren't like that congruous because this tail sure. section with the airbox is inherited from the KTM 890, 990 Duke, is it? Or the mm. 890, something like that. I don't know, mate. I mean, like, there's something... With the tank, I could sort of see an argument with the kind of the way that the tank um, flexes out at the sides. Yes. um, Which is quite a bold styling move. But in terms of its proportions and stuff, if you were to just sort of judge that on its beauty, I think it is a really nice-looking bike. And I actually think it does look... It brings it a little bit more modern. It's still got the same influence. Still still got very similar kind of design um, influence. But yeah. it, uh, I think it moves it on a step further. But I mean, if you could post a picture of Scarlett Johansson and you're going to find someone out there that's going to say she's ugly. Well, and it's down to your taste, isn't it? You know, I some people so. just like to watch the world burn, all right? And some people <laughs> like to just be contrary and throw in whatever they want to. You know? well, and genuinely, some people have different tastes. So some people might actually think that looks ugly as, but no, for my eye, I, I think that's one of the prettiest spikes this year. I'm I'm going to be the contrarian and Ooh. just throw this out there. One of the things that I don't love on bikes is when everything's going in different directions. Like take the new Triumph 400s. One thing I mentioned in my review mm. is is that with a Scrambler 900, for example, everything's flat. And mm. look at how the exhaust, the fins on the cylinder head, the seat, the tank. They're all horizontal and looks really nice and classic. Yeah. With this, it's kind of like the seat is sort of flat, but the tank angles down. Yeah. But then yeah. the angle of the engine's a bit like that. Mm. And then it's kind of straightish at the bottom, but not as angled mm. as that. And then this flicks up and it just doesn't look as congruous as mm. this. And I would say the same for the Spark Pillin 801, where the shoulders on the tank and these radiator cowls yeah. aren't all working together with this subframe exhaust air vents side panels i still think it's quite nice looking but i can see how someone might feel like especially with the engine canted forward and again on a different angle mm. can see how someone might say that that's not quite as good looking as the old 401 ding look at that straight straight some curves like that, but nothing that really mm. kind of like jumbles it up. Now, having mm. heard my argument, my contrarian argument, how do you feel now? <laughs> <laughs> or do you stand by your word? Uh, yeah, no, I'm sticking with it. I'm, uh, I'm going to double down and say you're all wrong. Um, okay. No, it's, it's, honestly, it's down to your different opinions. But no, to me, to... Just for glancing at it, I think I think it really works. I like the look of it a lot. I mean, more it's, than this, though. Yeah, because I could pick apart little parts of that as well if I was obsessive on, compulsive. Although, don't tell NPADV because he said it's <laughs> the best looking one. You might want to switch off I now, NPADV. Me. I wasn't actually looking for the challenge. All right, I don't like the radiator. That angle's slightly wrong. You've got your little blobby yellow on there. Not a big fan of that. It's uh, it's a little bit blocky looking. No, it's um, to be honest, it's a pretty looking bike. I can't really pick too much against that. But then I can't really pick much against the 801 either. I've okay. got bikes that I absolutely could pick apart, but it wouldn't be the 401. Because I'm not saying that that one was ugly. I just think it's uh, a progression to get to this new one. And I do think, for me, it looks slightly better but not by a huge amount because the original wasn't an ugly bike what you're saying is that broadly you're a lover not a hater yeah all right just let people unless it's a ktm then yeah i'm i'm a lover of most things (laughs) (laughs) Uh, and not to ride i like just to just to clarify (laughs) i I love to ride a ktm but i just don't like the looks yeah i think you're probably not alone on that front anyway it's time to wrap up with bike of the week and oh it's on topic, actually, because we were just talking about the Triumph 400s. Another little screen mm. share for you here. And it is. I don't know if you've seen this. I can't wait to show you. Ding. Nice. So, yeah, Triumph, obviously. Is it the new 400? Yeah, Triumph Scrambler 400X. They've taken yeah. it and turned it into a bit of a bad boy. So they've said. kind of addressed maybe one or two, literally what you just said about the kind of angles fighting each other. Um, in conflict. I think they've addressed some of that. The one thing, I've never been a massive fan of that really long uh, mosquito-esque mudguard. 
Oh, you didn't um, like the high mud guards on Scramblers? Uh, I do, some of them, although I, I have to admit, I mean, it is one of those things where it's like style over function. And you know when you see the stubby ones that you put on bikes, like custom yeah. jobs, right, that we all know do nothing, completely, you know, unfunctional. Um, but they definitely look better until you're out and you've just caked your headlight in mud. Um, yes. So I understand the use of the longer... Uh, mud guard and I think some bikes get it right and I think that one is just a little bit kind of too flimsy looking actually almost because it's a little bit too sort of needle-esque it's a bit too pointy Ooh, go back nah. a bit. that speedo looked really nice well let's like talk that about that in a minute outside. I was going to do a rundown of the build okay so <laughs> yeah. I believe what they've done here is they stripped it back took everything off um, to get it down to its most basic form looped or hooped or whatever you call it shortened the subframe and put a loop on the back there mm -hmm. made that um custom saddle which i think looks really nice as well yeah shortens up the back end for that sort of custom scrambler look uh cleaned up all the bars so new grips new little bar end mirrors um mm -hmm. different risers as well mm. and one thing that i think really works as well is they've repainted the fork which is gold anodized mm. on the standard bikes and i think it maybe looks a bit better in black or gray like well, this. Well, certainly with that color scheme, yeah, the gold would yeah, look definitely. well out of place, so that's really nice. But even if you look now at the khaki green version of the um, standard Scrambler 400X, having seen this and then looking at it, you think, well, that probably would look a bit more tasteful, let's say, yeah. with a black fork. I mean, yeah, look at that. Okay. It really sort of like jumps out. Imagine if it was just black. Mm. It'd look a bit mm -hmm. more just sleek. Anyway, I think in the same way that like gold wheels add a few horsepower, as we all know, um, you think gold fork add a few does. millimeters in terms of uh, travel. travel. Yeah, uh, they handmade that uh, mudguard that you slagged off. Oh well, they can take that back to the shop then. That's, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they failed. Smaller headlight with a little cage that they've made for it. Um, yeah, I like they that. They cut a lot. up the old mudguard, I believe, and made it into these um, fork deflectors. All oh, right, knobbly tires, uh, custom exhaust. There, look. Looks yeah. super cool. So that high suits level. the the lines, right? You were saying about the engine, even the lines of the tank, they're all going the same way. Yes, the ribbed so, yeah. engine covers, which yes. then make it all look more intentional. Yeah. Uh then the paint job on the tank as well. Yeah. And a black chain, that's probably worth a bit in terms of uh performance. Yeah. And the thing that Tim almost alluded to just then, along with this mm. tank strap. Is they move the That's speedo good. from the cockpit to make it look a bit more custom yeah. down to where the engine is. As always, we'd love to know what you think of it. So do let us know in the comments. And if you've got any suggestions for future bikes of the week, then do let us know. A huge thanks for listening uh, today. And you can also watch on YouTube, as I've said. So I'd thoroughly recommend it as the, um, you know, the premium experience of the Full Tank Motorcycle <laughs> podcast complete with pictures of bikes and when there isn't yeah. anything to show you just get to look at me and tim which annoys some people i don't know if you've seen any of the comments tim on the london motorcycle um, show There's a few sure. people saying stop showing these guys Less and showing more of the bikes <laughs> unbelievable Fair comment. Fair unbelievable comment. anyway <laughs> massive thanks to, for listening everybody and we'll see you next time